Mathematics. <clears throat> Mathematics is an abstract discipline of such austere beauty that it's often surprising to find that its words and symbols have dull, concrete origins. Calculus is a formidable word that loses some of its grandeur when you realise that a calculus is just a little pebble, because the Romans did their maths by counting up stones. Oddly, an abacus, which you might reasonably have expected to mean little pebbles, comes ultimately from the Hebrew word abak, meaning dust. You see, the Greeks who adopted the word didn't use pebbles. Instead, they used a board covered with sand on which they could write out their calculations. When they wanted to start on a new sum, they simply shook the board and it became clear, like the classical etch-a-sketch. Average has an even more mundane explanation. It comes from the old French avari, which means damage done to a ship. Ships were often co-owned, and when one was damaged and the bill came in for repairs, each owner was expected to pay the average. A line is only a thread from a piece of linen. A trapezium is only a table and a circle is only a circus. But the best of the mathematical etymologies are in the signs. <coughs> People didn't used to write one plus one. They would write the sentence one et one, which is Latin for one and one. To make the plus sign, all they did was drop the e in et and leave the crossed t. By coincidence, et also gave us and, as in ampersand, and you can see how E, the Greek E, became simply the ampersand by messing around with the typefaces on your word processor. The Greek E followed by T. Type an ampersand and then switch the font to trebuchet and you'll get the ET. To French script MT and you'll get a different symbol and curls MT and you'll get another one, Palatino Linotype and you'll get ampersand and finally as this book is printed in Minion you get ampersand again. Most mathematics used to be written out in full sentences which is why the equals sign was invented by a 16th century Welshman who rejoiced in the name of Robert Record. Robert had got thoroughly bored of writing out the word is equal to every time he did a sum. This was particularly irritating for him as he was writing a mathematical textbook with the memorable title The Wet Stone of Wit, which is the second part of Arithmetic, containing the extraction of roots, the Cossack practice with the rule of equation and the works of absurd numbers. This is the prolixity. The prolixity of the title was matched by the brevity that the book brought to algebra. Record wrote to avoid the tedious repetition of these words, is equal to, I will set as, I often do in work, use a pair of parallels, or gimo lines of one length, thus equal sign, because no two things can be more equal. So an equal sign is equals because the two lines are of equal length. Robert Record published his whetstone of foot and the rest of it in, in 1557 and died in debtor's prison the following year, thus demonstrating the difference between good mathematics and good accounting. Record thought that the two lines of the equal sign were so similar that they were like identical twins, which is why he called them gemo, meaning twin. Gemo derived from the old French gemeus, which was the plural of gemel, which came from the Latin gemellus, which was the diminutive of Gemini. Stellified and oily beavers. The zodiac is, of course, the little circular zoo that runs around the sky. It's a zodiac because 11 of the 12 signs are living creatures 
and seven of them are animals. In fact, when the Greeks named the zodiac, all of the signs were living creatures. Libra, the odd one out, was added by the Romans. The zodiac is filled with all sorts of strange word associations. Cancer is the crab, largely because Galen thought that some tumours resembled crabs, and partly because both words come from the Indo-European root quark, which means hard. Goats such as Capricorn skip about and are generally capricious or goat-like, and bulls like Taurus, get killed by Toreadors. But let's stick for a moment to Gemini, the twins. The twins in question are two stars called Castor and Pollux, and how they came to be here is a tender and touching story. Despite what astronomers would have you believe, most of the stars were created not by energy cooling into matter, but by Zeus. Zeus had a thing for a girl called Leda and decided to turn into a swan and have his wicked way with her. However, later that night, Leda slept with her husband, Tyndarius, and the result was a rather complicated pregnancy and Leda popping out two eggs, which is enough to make any husband suspicious. The first egg contained Helen, later Helen of Troy, and Clytemnestra. The second egg contained Pollux and Castor. Extensive mythological paternity testing revealed that Helen and Pollux were the children of Zeus, and Castor and Clytemnestra were the mortal children of Tyndarius, which can hardly have been much of a consolation for the poor chap. Castor and Pollux were inseparable until one day Castor was stabbed and killed. Pollux, who was a demigod, struck a deal with his dad that he could share his immortality with his twin brother. And the result was that Zeus turned them into two stars which could be together forever in the heavens. Well, in fact, they're 16 light years apart, but let's not get bogged down in details. Castor was the Greek word for beaver. And to this day, beavers all across the world belong to the genus Castor, even if they don't know it. We usually think of beavers as sweet little creatures who build dams, but that's not how a constipated Renaissance man would view them. A constipated Renaissance man would review them as his relief and his cure. You see, the beaver has two sacks in his groin that contain a noxious and utterly disgusting oil that acts as a very effective laxative. This is very valuable liquid and is known as castor oil. The name survives, but the source of the liquid has changed. To the delight of the beavers everywhere, people discovered in the mid 18th century that you can get exactly the same bowel liberating effect from an oil produced from the seeds of Racinus communis, also known as the castor oil plant. So though it's still called castor oil, it's no longer obtained from the groin of a beaver. Several anatomical terms derive from the beaver, but in order to keep this chain of thought decent and pure and family friendly, let us for a moment consider that beaver was once the word for a beard. Beards. The number of hidden beards in the English language is quite bizarre. Bizarre, for example, comes from the Basque word bizarre or beard. Because when Spanish soldiers arrived in the remote and clean-shaven villages of the Pyrenees, the locals thought that their bizarres were bizarre. The feathers that were stuck into the back of arrows were known by the Romans as the beard or barbus, which is why arrows are barbs. And that's ultimately the reason why barbed wire is simply wire that has grown a beard. Barbus is also the reason that the man who cuts your beard is known as a barber. The ancient Romans liked to be clean shaven as beards were considered weird and Greek. So the barbers plied a regular and lucrative trade until the fall of the Roman Empire. Italy was overrun by tribesmen who had huge long beards 
which they never ever trimmed. And these tribesmen were known as Longababa or Longbeards, which was eventually shortened to Lombard, which is why a large part of northern Italy is still known as Lombardy. The Romans by that time had become effete, perhaps through a lack of facial hair, and couldn't take their opponents on, so they had been, if they had been more courageous and less shaven, they could have stood beard to beard against their enemies, which would have made them objectionable and rebarbative. What the Romans needed was a leader like General Ambrose Burnside, who fought for the Union during the American Civil War. General Burnside had vast forests of hair running up from his ears and connected to his leviathan moustache. So extraordinary was his facial foliage that such growths came to be known as Burnsides. However, Ambrose Burnside died and was forgotten, and later generations of Americans, reasoning that the hair was on the side of the face, took the name Burnside and bizarrely swapped it around to make sideburns. And it's not only humans who have beards, nor, nor only animals. Even trees may forget to shave, namely the giant bearded fig of the Caribbean. The bearded fig is also known as the strangler tree and can grow 50 feet in height. The beards and the height and the strangling are connected for the tree reproduces by growing higher than its neighbours and then dropping beard-like aerial roots into their unsuspecting branches. The beards wrap themselves around the victim until they reach the ground where they burrow in and then tighten, strangling the host. There's an island in the Caribbean filled with them. The natives used to call it the red land with white teeth. But the Spanish explorers who discovered it were so impressed with the psychotic and unshaven fig trees that they called it the bearded ones or Barbados Islands. Some parts of the English language can only be reached by boat. For instance, there's a small dot in the middle of the Pacific Ocean whose natives call their home Coconut Island or Bikini, which was mangled into English as Bikini Atoll. For centuries, nobody knew about Bikini except its natives. And even when it was discovered by Europeans, the best use that anyone could think of it for the place was as a nautical graveyard. When a warship had outlived its effectiveness, you would be taken to the beautiful lagoon and sunk. Bikini Atoll was put on the map, and almost removed from it, by America in 1946 when they tested their new atomic bombs there. Atom is Greek for unsplittable. But the Americans had discovered that by breaking the laws of etymology, they were able to create vast explosions, and vast explosions were the best way of impressing the Soviets and winning the Cold War. However, the tests at Bikini had a more immediate effect on the French and the Japanese, both perhaps illustrative of their national characters. In 1954, the Americans tested their new hydrogen bomb, which they had calculated would be a little more powerful than the A-bombs they'd previously been mucking around with. It turned out to be an awful lot more powerful and ended up accidentally irradiating the crew of a Japanese fishing boat. Japanese public opinion was outraged as the Japanese and Americans had a rather awkward military and nuclear relationship. Protests were made, hackles were raised, a film was made about an irresponsible nuclear test that awoke a sea monster called Gorilla Whale or Gojira. The film was rushed through production and came out later the same year. Gojira was allegedly simply the nickname of a particularly burly member of the film crew. Gojira was anglicised to Godzilla and the film became so famous across the world that Zilla became a workable English suffix. A bride-to-be who's become obsessed with every fatuous detail of her nuptials from veil to hem is now called a bridezilla and one of the world's most popular internet browsers is mozilla firefox 
whose name and old logo can be traced straight back to the tests at Bikini Atoll. But where the Japanese saw a threatening monster, the French saw what the French always see, sex. A fashion designer called Jacques Heim had just come up with a design for a two-piece bathing costume that he believed would be the world's smallest swimsuit. He took it to a lingerie shop in Paris where the owner, Louis Réard, proved with a pair of scissors that it could be even more scandalously immodest. The result, Réard claimed, would cause an explosion of lust in the loins of every Frenchman, so powerful that it could only be compared to the tests at Bikini Alcohol, Al Atoll, so he called the new swimwear the Bikini. So by a beautiful serendipity, it's now possible to log onto the internet and use a Mozilla browser to look at pictures of girls in bikinis, knowing that the two words spring from the same event. Oh, the word serendipity was invented in 1754 by Horace Walpole, the son of the first Prime Minister of England. He was kind enough to explain exactly how he'd come up with the word. He was reading a book called The Voyage des Trois Princes de Serendip, which is a story of three princes from the island of Serendip, who were sent by their father to find a magical recipe for killing dragons. Walpole noticed that as their highnesses travelled, they were always making discoveries by accidents and sagacity of things which they were not in quest of. Though the story of the three princes that Walpole read was pure fiction, the island of Serendip was a real place, although it has since changed its name, first to Ceylon and then in 1972 to Sri Lanka. So a serendipity is really a Sri Lankaness. Now let's cross the Indian Ocean and head up the Suez Canal to Sardinia. In fact, let's not, because the people of Sardinia are a nasty bunch. In ancient times, they were considered so waspish and rebarbative that any unfriendly remark would be referred to as a Sardinian, which is where we get the word sardonic. However, Sardinia also gave its name to the little fish that were abundant in the surrounding seas, which are now called sardines. We could go to the island of Lesbos, but that would make us very popular. The most famous resident of Lesbos was an ancient Greek poetess called Sappho. Sappho wrote ancient Greek poems about how much she liked other ancient Greek ladies. And the result was that in the late 19th century, lesbian became an English euphemism for ladies who like lazies. The idea, of course, was that only people with a good classical education would understand the reference. And people with good at classical education would have strong enough minds not to snigger in this, lesbianism was considered preferable to the previous English term, tribadism, which came from the Greek word for rubbing. Before being adopted in the 1890s, lesbian was the name of a kind of wine that came from the island so you could drink a good lesbian. Of course, it also was and is the name for the inhabitants of the island, not all of whom are happy with the word's new meaning. In 2008, a group of lesbians from the island tried to take out an injunction against a group of lesbians from the mainland to make them change the name of their gay rights association. The injunction failed. But just to be on the safe side, let us sail our etymological ship out through the Straits of Gibraltar and head for the islands where dogs grow feathers. The Romans found some islands in the Atlantic that were overrun with large dogs. So they called them the Dog Islands or Canaria. However, when the English finally got round to inspecting the Canaria a couple of millennia later, all they found there were birds, which they decided to call canaries, thus changing dogs for birds and then into a pretty shade of yellow. Now let's continue due west to get to the Cannibal Islands. When Christopher Columbus sailed west across the Atlantic, he arrived at the Caribbean islands, which he rather hopefully called the West Indies, 
because the purpose of his voyage had been to find a western route to India, which everyone in Europe knew to be a rich country ruled by the great Khan. Columbus was therefore terribly pleased when he landed in Cuba and discovered that the people there called themselves Canibs, because he assumed that Canibs must really mean Carnibs, which is a rare triumph of hope over etymology. In the next island Columbus came to, they told him that they were Caribs, and at the island after that they were Calibs. This was because in the old languages of the Caribbean, N's, R's and L's were pretty much interchangeable. The sea got named the Caribbean after one pronunciation, but it was also believed in Europe that the islanders ate each other, and this gastronomic perversity came on the basis of another pronunciation to be called cannibalism. Whether they did, did actually eat each other is a subject that's still disputed. Some say they did, others say it was just a projection of European fears, and it's true that the European imagination was set humming by these stories of far-off islands. William Shakespeare's play The Tempest was set on a desert island, where a strange half-man, half-fish is the only true native. There definitely aren't any men fish in the Caribbean, but that didn't stop Shakespeare for naming his bestial character Caliban, after the third possible pronunciation. But now we sail onwards through the Panama Canal to the last of our island chain, Hawaii, after which the world's most popular snack was almost named. Sandwich Islands. The first European to stand on the shores of Hawaii was Captain James Cook, who arrived there in 1778 and died there in 1779 after an unsuccessful attempt to abduct the king. Captain Cook introduced the words tattoo and taboo into English, both having been practices that he came across in his Pacific voyages. But there was one name that he couldn't get into the dictionary or even the atlas. European explorers loved to name the places that they discovered, a habit that didn't always endear them to the natives who felt that they must have discovered the place first, as they were already living there. So although Cook noted down that the locals called his new discovery Owihi, he knew which side his bread was buttered and decided to rename the place in honour of the sponsor of his voyage. Captain Cook was, of course, thinking of his future career, something that he probably should have considered when abducting the king. For Cook's sponsor was, at the time, the first Lord of the Admiralty, Lord Montague, fourth Earl of Sandwich. But the name Sandwich didn't stick, and Cook died before his sponsor could even hear of the attempt. The poor Earl of Sandwich has had to make do with the South Sandwich Islands, which are an un uninhabited chain of rocks near the South Pole, Montague Island, an uninhabited island near Alaska, and every sandwich shop, sandwich maker and sandwich filling in the entire world and he managed the latter feat without ever going near a bread knife. The Earl of Sandwich was a gambler. And not just any sort of gambler. He was an addict who lost money hand over fist, over hand over fist. Even by the British standards of the time, he was considered a bit odd, and the British were famous for gambling. The first and only account of the origin of the world's favourite snack comes from a French book in 1765 about what terrible gamblers the English are. It runs thus. The English, who are profound thinkers, violent in their desires, and who carry all their passions to excess, are altogether extravagant in the art of gaming. Several rich noblemen are said to have ruined themselves by it. Others devote their whole time to it at the expense of their repose and health. A Minister of State passed four and twenty hours at the public gaming table, so absorbed in play that during the whole time he had no subsistence but a bit of beef between two slices of toasted bread, which he ate without ever quitting the game. The new dish grew highly in vogue during my residence in London. It was called by the name of the minister who invented it. The author didn't mention the name of the minister because he was a Frenchman writing for a French audience in French, so there'd be no point in explaining the origin of an English word. 
It's therefore a delicious twist in the tale that sandwich is now one of the few English words that everybody in France knows too. There's a myth that the Earl of Sandwich invented the sandwich. He did not. He had servants and chefs to actually make his food, make his food for him. Sandwich simply made sandwiches cool. People have almost certainly been stuffing things between two slices of bread since the stuff was invented around the end of the last ice age. What the Earl of Sandwich did was to take a humble little snack that you wouldn't think twice about and give it associations of aristocracy, power, wealth, luxury and 24-hour gambling. Great men and women do not busy themselves in the kitchen hoping to achieve the immortality that can be conferred by a recipe book. They simply wait until a food is named after them. Take Margarita Maria Teresa Giovanna, Queen of Italy, the wife of Umberto I. She never climbed Mount Stanley, but Mount Stanley's highest peak still bears her name. She certainly never cooked any pizzas, but they were made for her and they had to be fit for a queen. Italian aristocrats of the 19th century didn't eat pizza. It was peasant food flavoured with that peasant favourite, garlic. However, in the 1880s, European royalty, wary of re revolution, were all trying to be nice to the common men whom they ruled. So when King Umberto and Queen Margherita visited Naples, the home of the pizza, a man named Raffaele Esposito decided to make a pizza fit for the lips of the Queen. Esposito was the owner of the Pizzeria di Pietro e Basta Così, and he got over the garlic problem by simply not using any garlic an idea that was previously unheard of. He then decided to make the pizza properly patriotic and Italian by modelling it on the colours of the flag, red, white and green. So he added tomatoes for the red, nobody had done that before, mozzarella for the white and herbs for the green. He then named it Pizza Margarita and sent it in June 1889 to the Queen. To be honest, Queen Margarita probably didn't deign to eat the first margarita, but she did have one of her servants write a note saying thank you. Thus has her name been immortal, and a coded version of the Italian flag is on the menu of every pizza restaurant in the world. The Italian flag consists of three vertical stripes. The design is based on le tricolore, the flag of the French Revolution. The French Revolution in English words. When the world changes, language changes. New things need new words, and the new words of a period betray the inventions of the age. The Vietnam War gave American English bong and credibility gap. You can follow the history of the English-speaking world by watching the new words flow by. The 40s gave us genocide, quizzling, crash landing, debrief and Cold War. The 50s gave us Countdown, Cosmonaut, Sputnik and Beatnik. The 60s gave us Fast Food, Jet Lag and Fab and so on through Watergate, Yuppie, Britpop and Pawned. But nothing has ever been as new as the French Revolution, which was essentially a mob of new ideas armed with pitchforks and intent on murder. Every new event, every new idea, had to be rendered for the English-speaking world in new words that were being imported from the French. Each twist, turn, beheading and storming was reported a few days later in Britain, and the course of history can be seen in the words that were imported from French. 1789, aristocrat. 1790, sans culotte. 1792, capitalist regime and émigré, 1793, disorganised, demoralised, meaning made immoral, guillotine, 1795, terrorism, meaning government by terror, 1797, tricolore, and the tricolore, as we know, would survive both as a flag and a pizza topping. Moreover, the French contribution to the English language, which had been going on for centuries, would continue for centuries more. 
About 30% of English words come from French, though it depends, of course, on how you're counting. This means that though English is basically a Germanic language, we are at least a third Romantic. Romance languages. French is a Romance language because the French are, by definition, Romantic. Once upon a time there was a thing called the Roman Empire that was ruled by Romans in Rome. However, the language they spoke was not called Roman, it was called Latin. The Roman Empire was a grand affair. They had lots of great authors like Virgil and Ovid who wrote books in Latin. They also had a frighteningly efficient army that spread death and Latin to every part of the known world. But empires fall and languages change. 600 years ago, Chaucer could write Al besmottered with his harbagion. But it's difficult today make out what it, to make out what he meant, unless you've studied Chaucerian English. The same thing happened to the Romans and their Latin. There was no sudden break, but little by little their language changed until nobody in Rome could understand the great authors any more unless they'd studied Latin at school. Slowly, people start, had to start distinguishing the old Latin from the language that people were speaking on the streets of Rome, which came to be known as Romanicus. The Dark Ages darkened, and the difference between Latin and Romanicus grew larger and larger. Latin was preserved in a way. Classical Latin, or something very like it, became the language of the Catholic Church and of academic discourse. If you wanted to write something that would be taken seriously by a pope or a professor, you had to do so in Latin. Even as late as 1687, Isaac Newton still needed to call his great work Philosophiae Naturalis Principia Mathematica and publish it in Latin. Yet in the Middle Ages, most people didn't want to read books about theoretical theology. They wanted stories about knights in shining armour, beautiful damsels in distress. They wanted fire-breathing dragons, enchanted mountains, fairy lands beyond the oceans, so such stories got written by the bucketful, and they were Romani scriberi, that is to say, they were written in a Romantic or Romanic. Not all versions of Romanic were the same. They had dropped the us by then, Romanicus. There was a Romanic that had developed in Rome, another one in France, another in Spain, another in Romania, but Romanic became the catch-all term for all these languages and then for all the stories that were written in them. Then lazy people stopped pronouncing the I or I in Romanic and the stories in the language in which they were written stopped being Romanic and started to be romances. And that's why to this day stories of brave handsome knights and distressed damsels are called romances. And when somebody tries to reproduce the atmosphere of such a tale by taking moonlit walks, or lighting candles at dinner, or remembering birthdays, or Valentine's Day, they are being romantic, or Roman. Peripatetic peoples. One word that has absolutely nothing to do with Roman romance or Romania is Romani. The people who have for centuries traveled around Europe in caravans have had an awful lot of names and all of them are insanely inaccurate. The most common name given to them by suspicious house dwellers is Gypsy, a name that derives from the utterly false idea that they're from Egypt. Gypsy and Egyptian used to be completely interchangeable words. Shakespeare in Antony and Cleopatra refers to Cleopatra's Gypsy lust in the very first speech. So where did this idea come from? The Romani ended up being called Egyptians because of a single event in 1418 when a band of them arrived in Augsburg claiming to be from Little Egypt. What exactly they meant by this is unclear, but they wanted money and safe conduct, which was given to them by the authorities and then denied them by the people. The Egyptian idea caught on and a legend grew that the Roma were cursed to wander the earth because when Joseph, Mary and Jesus were obliged to escape the wrath of Herod by fleeing to Egypt, a local tribe had denied them food and shelter. 
The gypsies, it was reasoned, were the descendants of this tribe, condemned to suffer the same fate for all eternity. In fact, the Roma are not from Egypt, but from India. We know this because their language is more closely related to Sanskrit and Hindi than to anything else. The word Roma comes from Rom, their word for man, which derives ultimately from Domba, a Sanskrit term for a kind of musician. That hasn't stopped the legends of their origin spreading though. The Egyptian mistake has been perpetuated in Hungary, where they are known as Pharaoh Nepek, or Pharaoh's people. But different countries have different legends and names, all of which are untrue. In Scandinavia, they were thought to be from Tartary, and they were called Tartars. In Italy, it was Wallachia and Wallachians. The Spanish believed that the Romani were Flemish Belgians. Why they thought this is something of a mystery. Most of the other European mistakes were at least based on the idea that the Roma had come from somewhere Eastern and exotic. Indeed, one theory runs that the Spanish were only joking. Whatever the reason, the Spanish started to call both the Roma and their style of music Flemish or Flamenco. The French thought that they must come from Bohemia, now the Czech Republic, and called them Bohemians. Then in 1851, a penniless Parisian writer called Henri Mauger came to write about life in the city's Latin quarter. He decided that the scorn that most of his fellow artists felt for the convention made them social Bohemians. So he called his novel Seine de la Vie de Bohème. The word caught on. Thackeray used it in Vanity Fair, and Puccini took Merger's book and turned it into an opera called La Bohème. And that's why unconventional and insolvent artists are known to this day as Bohemians. <laughs>